Welcome to Becoming Parents Podcast. I'm your host, Jen Taylor Campbell. I'm a birth and bereavement doula, as well as an adoption and surrogacy doula. Doula means woman who serves. And although I love happy births, adoptions, and surrogacy, the pro bono part of my business is in bereavement. I'm here to help you. I'm also mom of 18, yes, 18 children, with over 30 years experience in the trenches as a mom myself. We have a huge blended family, and I've also experienced the loss of our adult son. Remember, give a shout out to those brave enough to share their stories on how they have become parents. Let's dive in. Welcome to Becoming Parents podcast. I'm your host, Jen Taylor Campbell. And today I have on Joni Hallaby. How are you today? I am doing great, Jen. Thank you so much for having me on. I'm really excited. This is a really different story. I mean, I think it's probably a lot more common than people talk about, but you're the first person that's talked to me about it. So I'm very excited about that. Wow. Cool. Yeah. Um, so yeah, in. I, uh, Jump in. yeah, sure. Awesome. Yeah. So I, I am a single mother by choice. Um, and I have a wonderful four and a half year old daughter. Um, and, my story kind of really began when I was like 35, 36. And I like I had been dating like throughout my like adult life. I had been dating on and off. And I I would date men, I would date women. I wasn't really sure. I never really had like a serious um relationship with anybody. And then I realized, you know what, that's not that's not actually what I'm really looking for. I really want to start a family and I want a child, but having another romantic adult in my life was not actually that important to me. Um, so right about that time in my life, I started seriously researching what it would take to have a child just on my own. And I was reading a lot about, uh, the IUI process, IVF processes. Um, I started researching fertility clinics and, um, about a year later, I started going through the whole testing process with a fertility clinic and found out like, yeah, my physically I am, I am fine. I am ready to go. Um, and I went through the process of finding a donor sperm. I toyed a little bit with having a known donor. Um, and I did ask a, a really good friend of mine and he said no. And I'm actually very thankful that he said no, um, because I think having that anonymous donor was definitely the best choice for, for me and for my daughter. Um, but yeah, so I started looking at anonymous donors. I found, um, I found one that I really liked, like I really jived with his profile and, then probably about a year and a half ish later after I had started the process, I got pregnant, um, which is, it felt like a very long process and yeah. like on paper, it feels like a very short process. So it's, there's this weird dichotomy over there. Um, but yeah, I had a, I had a pretty decent pregnancy. Like it was, um, all pregnancies are just kind of weird. I think like everybody yeah. has their own pregnancy journey. Um, but I, I got very lucky, had very few problems and my, my daughter was born in, um, let's when, go back like actually two months after I turned 40. Yeah. Oh, yay. Two months after you turned 40. Okay. So one of the things oh. was, I know it was like, you decided at like 36 and a year and a half, but I was making sure that I wanted the time frames. Were you, mm -hmm. I have one question. Were you considered, um, yeah. What do they call it in pregnancy when you're older? And I hate that they do it. And I'm totally blanking it now. But it's like a geriatric oh, pregnancy, word... right? Oh, yeah. The word geriatric is in my medical file. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I mean, it's not that it frustrates me so much. Yeah. But like, so if you don't get pregnant, if you get pregnant before 20, you know, you're too young. You're there's a mm -hmm. whole teenage thing, but then you have this window. And if you don't get this window, you're geriatric. Uh, you're a runner, I think, right? I am. Yeah. I used to run much longer distances um, yeah, than too. I do right now. But, but I saw that <laughs> and you, you know, I signed up for a race once a running race. So I knew you could relate to this and I mm -hmm. was in my forties, but I think I must've turned 45 and they told me I was mm -hmm. in the Clydesdale 
that was the name of the 45 and older. And I'm like, oh, somebody needs, somebody needs to come in and rename these because it was like for women over 40, like that is the worst thing. Anyway, that reminds me of geriatric pregnancies, being in the Clydesdale division of running race. You don't want to do that. Yes. Okay. The, so the nice term. Yes. The nice term. Oh, sorry. No, yeah. The no. nice term for it is advanced maternal age. Right. That's what it and is. And they'll, they'll abbreviate it AMA. But, um, but I, I saw in one, one of like the notes, like it was geriatric pregnancy. I'm like, oh, geez, really? <laughs> and I, I think mean, it was when they realized I was going to be 40 when I gave birth. I just, you know, I, I, I mean, I'm a doula and I have a mom right now that's 30 and they're saying the same thing, advanced maternal age, love the baby at 31. And I just think, what are you talking about? A anyway, that's a totally different subject. In the beginning, in the IVF journey, when you were considering mm -hmm. this, what was interviewing like? What did that feel like for you? Was it a little surreal or was it just like, no, this is what I want to do and this is going to be great and the end? Like you, did you have any hesitation? Was there any emotional interviewing? Um, there was definitely, so there was definitely a lot of emotion because you're, um, I ended up doing IUI. I didn't have to quite go all the way to IVF, but there was a lot of, I had a lot of doubt of like, am I choosing the right donor? Because when okay. you start, you're just faced with a giant database. I think probably okay. in like the pre-internet days, you just got a book, but like now it's a database that you can search. And if you just look through all of the donors, it's overwhelming. There's a lot. Um, yeah. So you kind of have to narrow it down, but then you look at that filtering form and you think like, how, how on earth do I narrow it down? And there are so many criteria, like you can narrow down by, by race, by hair color, by occupation. <laughs> and they give like general industries for occupation, but um and it's, it's very surreal. So I was just kind of like clicking around and playing with different search criteria, but it's a lot, there was a lot of emotion behind like, am I making the right choices? Am I using the right filters? Like, what if I filter out somebody that I would have liked better? Um, but I mean, like I said, like once I actually had it narrowed down to about three people and I had a really good friend of mine come over and we just sort of hung out in my house with a bottle of wine and like staring at these three profiles and- <laughs> She That's helped awesome. me pick. It was great. I, yeah. I did foster care for years. And when you go through foster care training, you have to fill out forms that say kind of like what you're looking for, which is really vital. But a lot of people have a hard time. They're like, it feels like I'm picking out a puppy. You know, this isn't the SPCA because, mm -hmm. you know, you're like no sibling groups older than two. I'd prefer girls of this age. And it's vital because you really need to know what you can handle and what kind of you you can't handle especially in foster care and this sounds very similar where you almost need to be a little more dissociated you always almost need to take a step back and make some decisions on what your priorities are but it feels like picking out a puppy yeah you know? yeah it, i can't even imagine and going through that yeah i mean i like i kind of like i would feel guilt towards these these donors that like I don't even know these people of like, I would feel guilt. Like, Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm not choosing you. I'm sure you're really nice. Um, and I would find myself having these like pretend conversations with them that they will never know that I had, but right. Um, because they're all like, they were all like very solid choices. Um, and it, it really just came down to like the vibe that I felt. Um, what, what was really the deciding factor they give you, um, they give you essays and they have like question and answers that you can read through. And it was really like the personality of the donor that I chose that came out through, uh, through his essay and his personal statement. And I'm like that, that was, I think that was the clincher for him. He just had this kind of, he's very like straightforward, but kind of sarcastic and a little snarky. And I'm like, I, I could, I, I think I could be friends with you. I'm not that I'll probably meet you ever, but I could be friends with you. That <laughs> actually that is my awesome. daughter. Yeah. My daughter will actually, she'll get the choice when she turns 18. Um, he's what's called an, um, I forget the exact term. It's kind of like an open donor, but she gets a choice when she's 18 of whether or not she wants to initiate contact with him. Awesome. Um, okay. That was another so, question I had. 
Yeah. So I don't know. I mean, she's four and a half right now. Um, right. So I don't know uh, if she'll make that choice. She knows that she has, we call him a bio dad. So she knows that she has a bio dad and um, like there is no dad in our family. We are a mommy and me family. And she knows that I used a donor to help make her. Mm -hmm. Um, so like none of that has ever been a secret. I never wanted it to be a secret. Um, cause I felt it was just too important for her to know about. Um, but I don't, we haven't really talked about like the fact that she can meet him because I don't think she'll quite grasp that she has to wait another 13 years. Like right. she's just too young to grasp that concept right now. I applaud you for being open. I mean, I've done several adoptions in foster care and I know all the bio parents, right? And uh, mm -hmm. for me, like I got pictures of them and with them and any information. And I can tell you what, you know, Kezia's dad laughed. His laugh was contagious. Like I, there are things like, basically I wanted to get as much information as I could. And the kids knew mm -hmm. that they were adopted from the beginning. Mm -hmm. We didn't hide any of that. I think that there's some news that's so big and mm -hmm. teenagers are so tough and so emotional that finding out in that space would be mm -hmm. a real blow but growing up knowing it where it's real normalized makes it so it's just a conversation and it's a no big deal conversation mm -hmm. and some of them wanted to meet and have contact with bio parents and some of them didn't but I wanted to have enough information that that door could be open. So I applaud you having those conversations. Like it's just what you did. It, it's no big deal. Um, that's how you chose her where I chose my kids in different ways. Right. I, I that's right. excellent. I'm so proud of you. Oh, thank you so much. I, I love that you're having those conversations with your kids too. That's yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. And mine are all adults now. And so it was just, an, oh. it, it's just a normalized conversation as they're growing up that they're never mm -hmm. afraid to have with you and it's never scary um and it's never weird and it's never uncomfortable right. and then when they're old enough to really ask more questions it's just an easy conversation and then if they want to meet it you're so open and honest with them that it's just easier it's so much easier she'll come to you for that you know yeah yeah and that was like that was always my end goal like i didn't want her it just felt really traumatic like i feel I feel like it would have been really traumatic for her to find out if she was like when she was 12 or 13 or something like that, like if she was older and yeah. she just found out, right. I decided to like sit down and have like the quote unquote talk. talk. Like those are the kinds of moments that you remember, like you, like you would remember like, oh yeah, I was here and I was sitting here and my mom was sitting here when we had the talk. And I didn't, I didn't want that for her. I was wearing my Bon Jovi t-shirt and there, she baked bread <laughs> earlier that day. And it's almost a betrayal when you wait till later, right? Mm -hmm. It's almost like you lied and it's a betrayal where now it's just a normal conversation and no, same conversation, very yeah. different outcome. Yeah. So I, I call it turkey pasting. Very rude. <laughs> I, I mean, no ill intent. So <laughs> You didn't have to go to IVF though. You actually, you, it's IUI. Yeah, I did IUI. So that's, um, okay. intra uterine, um, insemination. So, okay. um, kind of like turkey basting. There's a big needle, <laughs> <laughs> um, glorified turkey. Pretty basting. uncomfortable. Yes. Okay. Not gonna, so not take gonna me lie. through it actually. Go ahead. Yeah. So, um, I, I got pregnant. It took me four rounds. Um, okay. and I know some women, it takes so many, so many more rounds. Um, actually, um, if I hadn't gotten pregnant that fourth round, we would have gone to IVF. Like that was, that was the decision that my doctor wanted me to go down. If like, he didn't want like a fifth, uh, a fifth IUI. Um, but yeah, you, um, I had to obviously like very carefully, like, track my period, track my cycles. Um, and I went through a lot of testing to make sure that, um, to, to make sure like I was ovulating when everybody thought I was ovulating. So yeah. we, we inseminated at the right time. Um, and yeah, so day of you, you just kind of walk into a doctor's office and it was funny, the doctor's office that I ended up at, it was a teaching office. 
And so a lot of times the doctor would come in with like one or two interns and be like, do you mind, do you mind if they watch? <laughs> sure. Why not? Have at it. <laughs> so I had an audience. Yeah, that's great. Um, that's great. But yeah, you just kind of lie on the table. They, um, they turkey based. Um, <laughs> they, do they actually insert a needle up through the cervix? Um, yeah, it goes, um, yeah, th- like through the cervix, like all, like all the way up, like intra and yep. you're going yep. into the uterus. So, um, it is grossly, uh, like, I found it very uncomfortable. I don't know if, ever, if anybody else does, um, but I don't know if, how detailed you want me to go into. You but, can go um, into as much, but I just know a normal cervix, even in ovulation is very tight. Mm-hmm. And getting anything through that is not comfortable. It was, yeah, it was a combination of, I also, um, I was also diagnosed with anxiety when I was about 24. So like I have, I have interesting anxiety. Um, I, your cervix is just generally tight. I was tighter than normal. Plus also my, my girl parts are tilted. So, oh, perfect. um, yeah, it was great. So great. So yeah, not not comfortable but it was one of those things that I'm like I really want to get pregnant I'm just going to power through this yep um so I mean they do it you kind of have to hang out there for 15 minutes just to make sure that like because it's technically a medical procedure so um they make you sit there for 15 minutes just in case like you have some sort of weird reaction your blood pressure drops it's almost I didn't I never made this correlation before because COVID wasn't a thing, but it's kind of like the wait that you have to do after you get your COVID vaccine. They mm-hmm. make you wait for 15 minutes just, just in case. Um, but like I was fine every time I would walk out 15 minutes later. Okay, see you later. Let's hope this works. Um, and then after that day, they have what we call the two-week wait, where you literally just sit there and you I mean you, you live your life, but right. you wait for two weeks, you can't test. And so you don't know if you're pregnant or not for another two weeks. Um, and like you wait and you wait and you wait. And I remember like, this was the second or third, my second or third try. I was convinced I was pregnant. I had like the sore breasts. I had like, I, I just felt like I was pregnant. Like I was really hopeful. And then I was not pregnant. <laughs> um, but that's yeah, that discouraging. Fourth try, that's discouraging so every discouraging. time, right? Yeah. How discouraging. And then you think, okay, I've got to go back and do it all over again. Yeah. It's like you, you either keep going or you don't, but like right. if you really, if, if you want to have that baby and it is expensive also because insurance, especially if you're a single mother, like insurance doesn't cover it because insurance will cover infertility. Um, But if you haven't, tried to have a baby but like right they don't they don't consider you infertile so um like every state is different I think some states are getting a little bit better about it um I live in Virginia and my insurance was just like no like you have to have at least like I think it was something like six tries before they would start even covering so they would cover my tests but they wouldn't cover any of the like the they wouldn't cover the procedure they wouldn't cover a lot of stuff. So it ended up being very expensive. So it's one of those, all right, well, do I, do I keep spending this money? Do I have the money to spend? Um, and I was so, I was so thankful it happened on that fourth try because IVF is like, yeah, it's a totally so different much more expensive and it's so much more work. And yeah. So the that fourth was, time, were you hopeful? Yeah. Were you at this point, I would think like, you don't even want to get your hopes up because you've been disappointed three times and you already know IVF is the next step. So you've got to like mentally start gearing for that. How elated mm-hmm. were you two weeks later when, I mean, I can only imagine, but you've gone through three times where it didn't work. Yeah. So how excited I, I, were you? So I found out at work, they called me while I was at work and I literally screamed. And then I I couldn't tell anybody because I wasn't, I wasn't, my boss knew because I had so many doctor's appointments. I didn't, I actually told her what I was doing because I didn't want her to think I was like interviewing somewhere else. Yeah. Um, But 
because that would have been awkward. But um, no, so like my, she knew um, and I told her right away um, and I told like a handful of friends, but like the vast majority of people I worked with did not know. So like I screamed and I'm like, oh, no, never mind. It's fine. Can't talk about it. <laughs> um, but I was I was over the moon. I was so excited. Actually, they um, they made me do the pregnancy test twice. <laughs> Uh, they make you, they make you test a few times, but the first test, they test your hormone levels. Like that's basically all a pregnancy test is they're testing your hormone levels. And, um, like your kind of baseline is maybe here and you're pregnant at about here and mine were like way up here. So okay. they, they thought for a minute that I thought it was having twins because oh, wow. my heart, like my levels just shot up so high that like the, like for, for a couple of weeks, they're like, let's, let's make sure there's only one. Um, and there ended up only being one. Um, they would have been okay with two. It would have put me in like a higher risk class, the higher than high risk class. Um, but like we started having conversations because it's very easy to have multiples when, even if you're doing IUI, like it's very, very easy to have multiples. They were saying like, listen, like we're going to have some hard conversations if there's three or more in there. Yeah. Um, but it ended up only being one. So you're pregnant. I don't know what <laughs> Yeah. Well, I mean, we never know Sorry. what we're going to do if that, like you have to deal with it when it happens, right? Because that would have been a very yeah, different exactly. situation. You would have been geriatric yeah. with multiples. <laughs> you don't <Gotcha>. want that. <laughs> so your pregnancy yeah. went well. Yeah. It went well. There was nothing really abnormal about it. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty, pretty standard. Um, I ended up... Um, my doctor kept telling me it was okay to still be active. It was okay to keep moving. Um, they approved me to run. So they said like, I could keep running until I wasn't comfortable with it. So I ended up running until I was 31 weeks. Yes. And I was so excited to be able to do that. And then I just felt because I gained all of my weight in my belly. Yeah. So I felt I was just like jiggling her around after a while. And it just felt really uncomfortable. And that, that was the point where I said, okay, you know, don't shake the baby. Like this is, yeah. it just felt like I was shaking the baby in my belly. Like it just, that it was very uncomfortable. So, I mean, I kept working out. I would, but I would do more like walking workouts. So I'd like incline walk on a treadmill, um, do very, very light weight lifting. Like it was something that I had already all, like I'd always been like just doing like dumbbell weights. Um, yeah. so my doctor said, it, you, I can still do that. Just no more than 20 pounds. So fine. Um, but yeah, I, my last workout was the day that I checked myself into the hospital to induce labor. Okay. So I want to jump into that. What I love that your mm -hmm. last workout was right when you were going into labor. That's awesome. Why did they <laughs> induce you? I, I read this part. I read your blog about, I read each of those blog posts mm -hmm. about the delivery. So I, I know a little bit about that. I um, definitely want you to mm -hmm. tell it in your words, but why did they induce you? It was purely age. She oh. was not ready to come out. It was purely because I was 40 and my high risk doctor was very adamant of like, you need to eat, like you need to be induced on your due date and we are going to schedule this and you're going to, you're going on your due date. Um, and I am pretty convinced that that, um, that she wasn't ready to come out. No, I didn't they, think so either. They, yeah, like they induced labor. So I um I checked myself into the hospital and then that night they gave me all the all the meds to start inducing labor. And the next morning they expected me to start being in labor and I wasn't. Um, like she was in position, like she had gotten into that like head down position um like weeks before. So like she was in the right position. But they looked at me and they're like, your levels aren't there. Nothing is open. Um, I was, I was still like zero dilated. Um, and they were, they were just looking at me like, do we induce again? Because at that point it had been somewhere between 12, I forget the number, but it was at least 12 hours after they had given me the meds because they gave me the meds and just went to bed. Um, and so we were having that discussion of like, okay, well, do we, do we wait for this to maybe kick in? Um, do we give you more medication to try to keep inducing you? And then my, 
um, my OB came in and she did a physical exam. And then she told me like, you know what? We need to do a C-section because she kept, she was feeling around and she, she told me and no other doctor had told me up until that point, my pelvis was too small for a baby's head to go through. So, um, I like, she was like, even if you go into natural birth, you're going to push and push and push. And then the baby's head is going to just kind of ram up against your bones and your bones aren't going to get any wider right now. And we're going to have to do an emergency C-section. So my choices were natural label, labor that was destined to fail, followed by emergency C-section or just skip straight to the C-section. So what a terrible naturally I, yeah. choice. I mean, basically she said, <laughs> you have a C-section or a C-section, when do you want to have it? So I mean, yeah. in that situation, I would have done the same thing. I would have just been like, what's the point? What's the point in continuing on? Oh, yeah. 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 Like, I, I definitely freaked out at that point because I was not, it was just a surprise. And I was thinking like, well, how my pelvis hasn't changed. Like, how how did nobody up until this point know? So I was a little angry, but um, like I talked to, um, like my mom was there. My mom was like, I have no idea. This is kind of new territory for her too. Um, and then I, I ended up calling a, a good friend of mine who um, both had a C-section and uh, was a nurse and has assisted on C-sections. And she's like, okay, this is what's going to happen. You're going like, to go in, you're going to go into the ER and then this and this and this. And she like stepped me through the whole procedure. And that actually calmed me down a lot. So yeah, I, I just decided, okay, well, if it's C-section or C-section, let's just do the C-section now and get it over with and get her out. And you had a great anesthesiologist uh, that played music for you. That was one of my favorite oh parts my of your story. He was the best. He was like, all right, I have Spotify open. What do you want to listen to? And he found the the folk rock uh, station on, on Spotify. And we just listened to that. And I felt absolutely nothing. Um, Great. he turned on the music and then a few minutes later, all I heard was, Hey, I see the head. And I hadn't even realized that they'd started. Um, wow. and then all of a sudden she was, born. it was amazing. Yeah. Oh, what was your, she was fine. Yeah, Everything was fine. she was okay. fine. What was your recovery like for that? Cause you're in pretty good shape. You're, you know, you're <laughs> very active. Yeah. I mean, recovery. Um, I spent a few days in the hospital, um, I had never been on anesthesia before. So I had some, uh, we'll just call it interesting reactions to the, it's like coming off of the anesthesia. Um, and I've never really reacted well to pain medication. Like pain medication just actually makes me sicker. Mm -hmm. Um, so once we kind of figured out pain management, I ended up going on like, just, they didn't give me any of the heavy stuff because the heavy stuff is actually what makes me sick. So they gave me, um, uh, just prescription grade Motrin. So like, once we kind of figured that out, um, I got released and like, she was fine. Um, she actually could have gotten released before me, but right. we kind of had to wait for me. So it was, it was only going to be a couple of days. So we figured, all right, well, we'll just get released at the same time. Um, and yeah, recovery was pretty good. I mean, I healed fairly quickly. Um, I am probably the worst patient and I kept forgetting to take my pain meds. So I, I took that as a good sign. I'm like, well, if I, if I can't remember to take my pain meds, I must not be in that much pain. So yeah, I guess I really don't need them. Um, but yeah, I healed, I healed pretty quickly. Um, because I have like, because of the C-section, I ended up getting eight weeks of, uh, maternity leave. So I had, it's, it's a lot for the U S it's not a lot yeah. globally. That's a whole other topic. That's a whole other topic. But it was it still is, great yeah. that you had that much. And then yeah. what a what an incredible story. I mean, pretty low key for all things, but it came from such a very specific decision of you wanting this despite the, your situation and wanting this more than another situation and just wanting her, you know, just wanting yeah. to be a mom. Have you thought about doing it again? Um. I thought about it. So every so often I get that feeling of, oh my gosh, I really want another baby. And then I think about the reality of it. And I think about 
it's just me and I would be outnumbered by children. And <laughs> I don't, I don't think I could do that. Like, I don't think I'm, I don't think I have that, um, that temperament to be able to handle more than one. I think I, I, I like being able to just concentrate all of my energy on my daughter and, mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I, I made the decision probably about a year ago, uh, that I'm done, but like, I'm just one and done. like I, which is that's great. it. And it makes me a little sad because yeah, I mean, I loved, I loved the newborn phase. Everybody was telling me, oh, you just have to like power through the newborn phase and then you get to the fun stuff. I actually really loved the newborn phase. Yeah. It was so, it was so amazing. Um, Let's, I want to wrap up because you are an author mm -hmm. and you're author of something very unique. And I would love to like all of your information and all the places that people can contact you, your blog and your website are in the show notes. So people can find you, including the book, but tell me, uh, I mean, tell us about the book and it will be clear why you wrote this book. So I, that would be a great way to end. Okay, sure. Um, so I wrote a picture picture book called Sweet Little You. And it is a welcome baby book that is specific for mothers and their donor conceived babies. Um, and I really, I just wanted this book to exist so badly. So we, um, my house has books everywhere. There's pretty much books in every single room, except the bathrooms. Um, that, I'm not a bathroom reader, I, but <laughs> anyway, either. Um, just not. but yeah, we, we have books everywhere. My daughter has a bookcase already. She's had a bookcase in her room since she was about one and a half. Um, because just having stacks was getting too much, but yeah, like we have books everywhere and we were gifted a lot of books when, um, I had my baby shower. I buy books a lot. We go to the library. We just, we just have books. Um, and we got, we've acquired like a good number of welcome baby books and I love them. There's, they're the cutest books ever, but I kept getting really annoyed when I was reading them because it would have all of these plural pl pronouns. So we welcome you. We are so excited that you're here. Mommy and daddy are, um, uh, love you so much. And, um, it was just like, we, 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 and that didn't, it didn't really feel genuine to our family situation. Um, so one night I just sat down and I, I, it just kind of came out the first draft, the first draft just came out in maybe like a half hour because I was just so frustrated with all these books. I'm like, I, I want a welcome book that is just for us. Um, so yes, I wrote, I wrote the first draft in about a half an hour and then it took me a year to edit it. Um, cause mm -hmm. writing a picture book is hard. <laughs> Every word matters. Um, so yeah, so I went, I went through the whole process of, um, I started looking at like some vanity publishers and I had a couple of interviews and they were very encouraging, but then I'm like, I really, I really want creative control. So I ended up self-publishing this book. Um, and I found this amazing, amazing illustrator. Her name is Lisa Wee and she, um, here I have, I'm just going to show the cover. Oh, it is. She knocked it out of the park with the illustrations. Like I, I love everything that she did with the artwork. Um, and yeah, it was published last August. And it's, it's my book, baby. <laughs> oh, yay. That's so, it's so important. This is so important. I'm, I'm super proud that you did that and that you made it something of your own. And if you couldn't get it, you figured out how to give it. So, so good. Joni, thank you so much for sharing your story. It's really unique and incredible. And I think that you're brave for being so honest about it. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Jen. Thank you so much for having me on the show. It's been great.